Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Northshire Live. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Rachel Person. I'm the event manager for Northshire Bookstore in Saratoga Springs, New York, here as I so often am these days with my wonderful friend and colleague, Gabith Wood, event manager for Northshire Bookstore in Manchester Center, Vermont. Um, a couple of quick notes before we get started. Um, first of all, you may have noticed as you came in that this meeting is being recorded for those who miss it, um, who had tickets, and then an excerpt of it will be up on our YouTube channel after the fact. Um, uh, but please don't worry if you have your camera on. We have the settings set so that it is only recording those of us who are unmuted and speaking in the little yellow boxes. So you will not be recorded. You will not be part of YouTube. You will not be out there for posterity. Um, and you can have your camera on. In light of that, please do use throughout the afternoon for any questions that you may have. You can type your questions there. We will save them up and Davith and I will pose them for you at the end of the afternoon. Um, so thank you uh, for that. And then last of all, before I turn things over to Davith for him to introduce our authors today is a note of thanks. Um, it's been a hard year in the world of independent businesses in general and independent book selling in particular. Um, Northshire has managed to stay afloat and keep our doors open. And that is really thanks to the incredible support of our friends and customers. We truly couldn't do it without you and we couldn't have great events like this without your support. So thank you very much for that help. Um, now, David, why don't you take things away and introduce our authors? Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, well, first we'd like to thank our friends at the Saratoga Performing Arts Center for their promotional support for this event. You can visit them at spac.org to check out their incredible lineup of programming for the summer season. It is my great pleasure to introduce Peter Wollivan, for his new book, The Heartbeat of Trees, Embracing Our Ancient Bond with Forests and Nature. Well, they've been spent over 20 years working for the Forestry Commission in Germany before leaving to put his ideas of ecology into practice. He now runs an environmentally friendly woodland in Germany where he's working toward the return of primeval forests. He is the author of numerous books about the natural world, including the New York Times bestseller and Northshire staff favorite, The Hidden Life of Trees, The Inner Lives of Animals, and The Secret Wisdom of Nature, which together make up his best-selling Mysteries of Nature series, and also numerous books for children, including Can You Hear the Trees Talking and Peter and the Tree Children. Kathleen Dean Moore, author of Earth's Wild Music, said that the great gift of Peter's latest book, The Heartbeat of Trees, is astonishment after astonishment. It is both a celebration of the wonders of trees and a howl of outrage at how recklessly we profane them. And we are very lucky today to be joined by author, journalist, and Audubon Medal recipient Richard Louv, whose books have been translated and published in 24 countries and helped launch an international movement to connect children, families, and communities to nature. He is the author of the temporary classic, Last Child in the Woods, and most recently, Our Wild Calling. Please join me in welcoming to Northshire, Peter Willaben and Richard Louv. Uh, Peter, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about the heartbeat of trees, and then uh, and then Richard, we can you can ask some questions too. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little bit shy. I'm a forester. You didn't only used to see trees. No, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, yeah, um, perhaps I'll tell you a little bit um, how it all started. Um, when I was a, a little child, I, um, in, uh, with the age of six, I wanted to become a conservationist. It sounds a little bit crazy for a little boy, uh, but uh, it was always fascinating by uh, animals, not by trees, but that uh, came later. And um, I uh, had spiders in glasses, for example. I had turtles in a big aquarium um, on my desk. And uh, if you know um, how to keep water turtles right, uh, then you know that you have, to, for example, that you have to change the water um, every uh, three to four days because it's so dirty afterwards. And uh, when, you, when you don't have that much money as a little boy, then you have to, to um, uh, take a tube and suck the water and bring the tube in the right moment out of the window. Just, but in the right moment, that's very important because otherwise you have the taste of wilderness. <laughs> that was my first first research on turtles. And um, yeah, when I when I uh, finished school, uh, mm -hmm. I thought about uh, studying biology and um, um, in, in Bonn and the near um, the former capital of Germany. 
And then I read a newspaper article about the German Force Commission um, that were searching for students. And I thought, okay, Forrester is someone like a tree keeper. And yeah, why, why not to become a forester and care, take care for the forest? And um, when I finished uh, studying forestry and, and um, starting uh, the work as a forester, I recognized that a forester is a little bit more like a tree butcher. Um, um, and, 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 uh, producing timber and not protecting trees. And um, then, then I started to care for old forests to, to, for the protection of the forest, which was really hard. And by the way, I made guided tours uh, through the forest. And um, I trained with, with my guests because when, when you explain in a boring way, then you get punished because then, then they start talking together, not um, listening anymore. And so you, you have to take all the technical terms out and you have to, to tell more with more empathy in a more emotional way. And that, that's how I trained telling about nature. Um, it was not a strategy. It's, it was just because I, I love my guests and I don't want to be a bad forest teacher. And after years, I think it worked well. And uh, the people were always asking, where can we read more about? Uh, the wonderful things um, around the forest. And I always had to say, no, there, there isn't any book. And uh, then my wife uh, begged for years, please write down perhaps the last 10 pages or so, so that I can hand out something written uh, about the forest to the people. And I refused for years, but one year I gave, it was in 2007, I gave up my resistance and uh, I wrote the first book. And said it to several publishers and said to my wife, if no one wants to read it, then that's it. And so that, that's how it started with the books. And uh, The Hidden Life of Trees was the 16th book. So it, it, it took a little training uh, and uh, then it worked, let's, let's say it like this, uh, to, to our surprise. Because um, I was a forester um, at this time, I'm still a forester caring for the trees and uh, working in the Forest Academy that I founded together with um, two colleagues. And uh, yeah, but it's, it's uh, a lot of fun and it makes me happy to take people like you all on a virtual guided tour through the forests um, of the world and, and of course of my home range. So, so um, it was, was not uh, a plan for me to become an author, but um, Perhaps I'm a little bit more like an end, like in Lord of the Rings, um, on, on the slow side of, of life. But in the other, way, on, on the other um, side, I have to speed up a little bit because our forests are endangered. And to save forests, the best method is to do it with love. So that's, and, and then I think we come to Richard because I think it's exactly your strategy, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Um... I'm, I told to Peter before we started, I'm one of his biggest fans, uh, you know, page after page, I think, you know, how uh, closely aligned uh, our thinking is, uh, including what you just said. Uh, and I, I need to mention, I see a couple people I know out there. One is um, uh, the great Cheryl Charles, who is one of the co-founders and our first leader of the Children of Nature Network, and Mary Roscoe, who is one of the uh, co-creators of the Children of Nature Network. Uh, um, you know, I, I, in terms of your books, first, I want to know how you, how you turn out so many books, particularly because unlike me, you have a real job. <laughs> uh, yeah, hmm. uh, I'm I'm uh, a guy who who is not able to say no. And if if there's uh, uh, something very important, for example, we have new research, which is so amazing um, that that it has to be be told. Uh, then I think, okay, hmm, perhaps it's time to write a new book. Or um, for example, the children's books. Many people say, okay, that, that's so important to tell all this to children. And I said, okay, yeah, but I, I don't have uh, time to write for children. Although I made I make uh, guided tours since twenty years also for children, and uh, but but one day uh, it's the same story. I said, okay, I'll write also books for children. Meanwhile, I say, um, 
I promise not to write more than two books a year and try to, to slow down to one book per two years because, uh, yeah, <laughs> although all you, you, Rachel and David, as booksellers make a wonderful job, so there, there has to be someone to read all this. Although there's, there's so many things to, to be told about nature. Um, so I, yeah, I have, have to, to manage my time, but, but to be honest, I'm not able to manage my time, my, my calendar uh, perfectly. So that's the, the job of my wife uh, who said, I, I will support you because I, my wife said once, please write a book. <laughs> that's, so that's a little bit her, her thing uh, to manage this. No, no, um, she's doing a very great job and she is the one um, who, makes the calendar in a way that I can relax. For example, um, she made, she arranged um, the, the, the appointment for today. And I just have to, had to uh, look at my calendar and say, oh, wonderful. Uh, I'm going to meet Jane again. I'm going to meet wonderful booksellers and I'm going to meet Richard, which uh, whom uh, I am, who I'm, I, I admire because uh, it's, it's so wonderful how, how you tell people uh, to better connect to nature and that it's so important. And I read that you um, even created a, a special term for uh, it, it's, um, if, if it's okay to, to cite it, it's uh, this nature deficit disorder, uh, which, which is, I think it's, it's very, very important. And it's, it's uh, one of the, the main goals that I have that, that um, we encourage children to, and adults and the whole family to go out in the forest and to experience that the best and most amazing wonders are out there, not, not on the screen. Um, how, how uh, the moderators, how, what do we do here? Do we just discuss or do you ask questions or lead the conversation? I'm confused. And I'm also stunned two books a year. I mean, really, Peter, I'm never going to introduce you to my editor. <laughs> she has a hard time getting any book out of me. Yeah. I need more time. No, no, I think, uh, I think you, what, what you did with your time was, was, was really great. So there are many, many uh, ways to, to uh, bring people closer to nature. And, and uh, you founded uh, organizations and uh, made a lot of things. So I think... Uh, Every one of us has, has a good, good and personal way to bring people closer to nature. Perhaps, um, so Richard, you're, um, uh, ideally you're interviewing Peter. So if you have questions okay. for him about his work, this would be a great time to do that. But you could also both talk generally about um, your experience of nature writing. Perhaps uh, I have a question for you, Richard, if it is okay. Uh, um, I've, I've learned a term which is, uh, which I experienced is even hard to pronounce for, for uh, people who speak English, um, that is, the, is to um, uh, anthropomorphize uh, the, the, the language and, and, the, and the stories about animals and plants. Uh, I guess that, that you were confronted a lot of times in your life with this term, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I've noticed from reviews of your books that we get similar comments from reviewers. You're saying we don't quite understand that anthropomorphism is a bad thing. And uh, I, there's a line I didn't use in the book, but I should have, which is, I think anthropomorphism is highly underrated. And it's the way you talk about anthropomorphism, which is, no, we don't want to project all of human characteristics on every animal we meet. Uh, it does take away some of their animalness uh, of who they of who they are as a species, um, but uh, you use the word empathy a lot, and that's a word that pops up in my books a lot too. To have empathy with other animals is some people mistake that for anthropomorphism. Uh, there's a guy his his name is Bird. Bergdorf, and I always forget his first name, I'm sorry. He's a professor, you may know of him, Peter, who, who talks about something he calls critical anthropomorphism, uh, which is, he's, a, he's a, a scientist, he's a biologist and also a psychologist, a herpetologist. 
And he says, if you're going to study a snake, you have to sit with the snake. You have to know the snake. And his process basically is two parts. He says, the first step is to conjure up your mind when you're with that snake, all this real hardcore science that you know about how that snake is sensing the world. What is it doing with his tongue? That kind of thing. And the second step is use your imagination. What would it be like to be that snake? Now, you know, we all realize you're on, a, on thin ice when we do that because we can't pretend to know what is, that snake is feeling. On the other hand, yes, we can pretend. We're both animals. And as you point out, particularly in your last book, that sense of empathy with, with other uh, animals uh, and, and plants it is really the, the doorway, I think, to, I think, the future of environmentalism and the future of our relationship with the planet itself. Um, and I think this critical anthropomorphism, and the, the, the best thing he says, by the way, is that once you do those st two steps and you become the snake, in a sense, he said, then you can ask a lot better scientific questions. So this is not anti-science, it's pro-science. And I'd like to see uh, critical anthropomorphism taught in public schools, in all schools for kids. Partly the reason is that by eighth grade, around eighth grade, at least in the US, uh, they pound the life out of biology. The schools do. It becomes math. And nothing wrong with math, nothing wrong with biochemistry and all that. But Peter, you grew up like I did. We loved those turtles. We didn't want those turtles turned into math. <laughs> so that empathy gets lost along the way. And that's one of the things I admire about your writing. You, you continually refer to that. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, that uh, was a school experience for me that, um, that we were taught that, that um, all living creatures are like machines. And uh, today we would say um, they, they were like uh, computers uh, driven by their genetic code. So um, without a soul, without um, emotions. And on the other hand, we say uh, we are intelligent and animals are, are living by instincts. Uh, and but emotions are the language of instinct. So animals should be, and as you know, they are good in emotions and that are the most important things in our life. Emotions, love, happiness, and things like that. So it's not so important uh, if you're able to write two books a year, <laughs> but it's more important that you have, you're happy, that you have a family who loves you. And uh, yeah, animals are very good in this. And um, uh, that comes to my uh, to my latest book, The Heartbeat of Trees. Um, why uh, did we choose this title? Because the heartbeat of trees has been overlooked by scientists. Because uh, Richard, I love love your description of being the the snake to understand the snake, and uh, to understand a tree, you, you first have to understand that a tree is very slowly. And if you want to research something, you have to take time. Most scientists forget this. So uh, the heartbeat of tree, uh, trees um, is a thing which uh, was not discovered by purpose. Um, but we're scientists that um, were researching on sleeping behavior of trees, which is cool enough, I think. But uh, because most people think, OK, trees are sleeping, but you can uh, watch this on your flowers in your garden. They have also sleeping behaviors. For example, they close, close their blossoms uh, and things like that. And then people say, ah, well, no, but that is that is not like, like a sleep. But this uh, sleeping behavior just means you behave different at nighttime than at daytime, <laughs> as, as we all know. And what, for example, dreaming really means, we don't know so far, but, but our brain is very busy uh, during nighttime. So we, we are not doing nothing, but we behave different. And flowers do this and trees do this too. So they, they hang their branches just a little bit, around about 10 centimeters. Um, and with sunrise, the branches go up and uh, the water pressure in, in, at nighttime is rising. So the branches should go up, not down. But we don't know uh, what this means. We, we just know trees behave different at nighttime. So they have a sleeping behavior. And this, the researchers, they um, uh, did this by uh, measurements with uh, laser. 
And by the way, they found out that the trunks were shrinking and expanding in a rhythm um, of three to four hours. And till this moment, it was not um, proven how the, the water comes up from the roots to the top of a tree. Because till then, uh, many people say, and you can uh, read this in many internet articles, that it is the transpiration of the leaves. And uh, the, the water gas is out, and that causes an underpressure in the, the, the trunk, and that pumps the water uh, out of the soil. But that's nonsense, because the highest water pressure in a trunk is before the leaves come out in spring. For example, then you gain the maple syrup, for example, um, and, and it's uh, when the trees don't uh, have any leaves. Because when the leaves come out, the water pressure sink, and that, then no drop will come out of the trunk. So it wasn't. Um, uh, proof till, till this moment. And this is the first guess that this may be this shrinking and expanding just uh, zero point somewhat millimeters. It's a very, very um, um, a little movement, but this may be the heartbeat of trees. And I love this discovery because it shows us we are um, on, in, in different speeds, uh, speeds uh, in, in our life on the way. And and many, many things have been overlooked. For example, that um, the trees are, uh, have also an, an electricity, um, electric signals in their bodies. Um, I've spoken with a um, scientist in Germany from the U University of Aachen, and she said, yeah, that was also overlooked because when you uh, make an electrical measurement and you pin your electrode in, let's say, one meter height and, and the next one, uh, one meter deeper, and then they, they uh, switch it on and say, ah, no signal is coming and switch it off. But you have to wait minimum for 10 minutes because trees are so slow. And then one day, one researcher said, ah, wow, there's a signal. So we have to wait a little bit because trees, uh, the, the speed of trees is around about 1,000 times slower than, than our speed. And I think that causes the most problems because trees, they can learn, they can help each other. Uh, they can create rain clouds, for example. They can do many, many things, but very, very slow. I was fascinated with that part of the book. Uh, and the, uh, um, you know, as you described that, it's almost how we look for intelligent life on other parts of the universe. You know, we wait for that signal for a long time, and there's no guarantee they're in the same time zone. Um, one of the really strong, wonderful images that's going to change my, I, I live up in the mountains east of San Diego in a forest, and it's mainly black oaks, some live oaks and other trees, but um, it's going to change the way I look at trees from here on, uh, which is, you said that essentially the correct way to look at a tree is upside down, that actually its, its head is near the near the dirt yeah. and uh, uh, because that's where the roots are and at the ends of the roots are what amount to little brains that reminded me of the structure of an octopus, you know, and the arms of an octopus, yeah. the, 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 each of those arms has what amounts to an independent brain and they work together and the roots similarly are looking for things and know how to go around rocks. And, and uh, so if you think of the tree upside down, that's, that, that literally uh, turns my uh, understanding of trees upside down. Uh, I, I think kids would just love that idea. Exactly. And it shows that we, are, we sometimes have the wrong look uh, on the world. And I love also that you mentioned that we are searching for intelligence in space because millions of species are waving and say, here, here we are. And we are overlooking yeah. them because we are looking up and not down. Yeah. Actually, the, the way you put it was better than I just said. You said that the uh, trees are standing on their heads. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. standing yeah. on their heads. And, um, there um, are scientists, for example, uh, at the University of uh, Bonn, uh, and they uh, research um, if um, plants and trees are conscious, if they have consciousness. And um, how uh, did they do this? Um, they, um, they found that um, 
the plants and uh, many, many plants and trees are producing pain suppressing substances. And um, if pain uh, would be just a reflex, um, which, which is of course, I think every uh, being on this planet needs to feel pain because when, when your body is, is damaged, uh, you have to recognize this um, instantly and you have to react uh, without thinking of whatsoever. So the pain is for us, as, as you all know, if you, if you feel pain, uh, you can't think uh, of other things because you have to react instantly. And But in some situations, uh, our body also um, pr uh, produces pain suppressing substances. Uh, for example, when you have an um, accident, uh, when you're under stress and when your consciousness uh um needs to be there uh if pain becomes too strong and you become unconscious uh that's very dangerous in some situations so your body is producing pain suppressing substances and plants uh, do this also um and that's uh, that's um 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 very strong research and um, is pointing in the direction that that plants are conscious but because uh, among biologists, uh, there are also many, many uh, which, which, uh, who are not uh, convinced and to say, no, um, we, we like to keep the, the border between animals and plants. And uh, so this is nonsense. Um, uh, so the one, one uh, scientist um, mentioned in the, in the New York Times article, um, when the journalists asked, uh, so do you think that plants are conscious? He said, you know, I have to ask this to the plants. So what, <laughs> I talked, I, I visited him and asked, what do you really think? He said, of course, plants are conscious. <laughs> but you didn't want to tell this to the newspaper. <laughs> That's a slippery way of avoiding a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and speaking of questions, if plants feel pain, how do you feel about eating plants? Yeah, uh, I think, yeah, that, that's, I think that's the, the biggest resistance uh, in, in our head and perhaps among those biologists who, who say, no, nonsense, uh, that we always, uh, always uh, think, ah, what will this do to our daily life? But this is science. And science sometimes uh, brings wonderful things. And sometimes uh, we think, mm, wow, what I'm doing there. But um, we are also part of nature. And we are constructed to, to eat other beings. We are not plants. We are not able to make photosynthesis. So, um, so we have to eat plants. I'm, I'm a vegetarian. I don't eat animals, but um, some people eat animals. And for me, it's OK. I, I only want to say that um, it's, it depends on how we treat them before using them, how we treat in general nature, whether it is on, on cornfields or whether it is in, on wild land. So uh, I think. We should pay nature more respect and perhaps think here and there, uh, is it really necessary what I'm doing? Can I um, give a little bit more space for other beings? Uh, it doesn't mean that we will lose something. We will gain so much fun, happiness, love. So there are so many creatures, Richard, as you describe it in your books, that are willing to come into contact with us, to communicate in, in many different ways. And uh, our senses are very, very good in, in um, communication with, with uh, other species. But uh, mostly, uh, for example, scientists try to train some, let's say, more intelligent. That's a question, but I, I just, I'm just repeating. More intelligent uh, creatures like chimpanzees or parrots to speak our language. And then they say, wow, what wonderful, what a wonderful creatures. And it would be much better. My daughter, uh, when, when she was very, very little, she, very young, she, she once said uh, at the breakfast table, uh, that if, if we are so intelligent, why don't we try to speak animal language? Yeah, and she got me. Well, as you know, there's some work on that. I mean, we're, you know, uh, prairie dogs understanding their language and, and by recording it and putting it in computers and, and decoding it would, I, I don't think, well, it's interesting. We're not, in that experiment, they're not speaking prairie dog, but they're speaking into a microphone that turns it into prairie dog, or that's the goal of that, that scientist. Yeah. Uh, and there's also uh, people working on 
special collars and uh, harnesses for dogs that connect to the leash that somehow tell the dog walker what the dog really wants and what the dog's really saying, which I think is crazy. I mean, we've only had about 30,000 years of co co-evolution with dogs. We know what they're saying to us, yeah. and, but we have to complicate it. Um, one of the issues in, in your books, often indirectly, is the issue of human loneliness. And um, in Wild Collie, in the latest book, that's one of the major themes in it is that, and in that I, I talk about the epidemic of human loneliness, which we now know uh, leads to some of the same diseases as uh, smoking and obesity, and uh, it's getting worse. Uh, and it's blamed on Mark Zuckerberg a lot, you know, with anti-social media and, and, but also bad urban design and all kinds of things. But I make the case that actually all of those things may be true, but our uh, loneliness epidemic is rooted in a deeper loneliness, which is species loneliness. That as a species, not just as individuals, but as a species, we are desperate to feel that we are not alone in the universe. Why else would we look for Bigfoot? Why else would we look for intelligent life on other plants, planets when it may not be a good idea to find it? It's because we, we, we're just part of us. We, we don't want to be in, alone in the universe. And as you write in your books, the great irony is we're not. It's a, this great conversation is going on all around us with other animals between species, across species, with trees, with other plants, between them and, and animals. And, uh, and it's not exactly like, as you point out, we can talk to trees, but that conversation is going on all the time. During the pandemic, I think, some people noticed that conversation when they were secluded in their houses. They looked out the window, noticed there were birds out there they'd never really looked at. And the birds kept them company and made them feel less alone. Um, so that's more of a statement than a question, I know, but I, I wondered if you could talk about that. No, no, but that's a good statement. Yeah, you're completely right. Um, I think uh, that's exactly what we are all feel in the moment, that we are lonely on, on this planet. Uh, and we, we see it in the everyday uh, newspaper articles about, for example, the climate change, that we say we have to save nature for itself. And that's not true. We have to save nature for ourselves because we are still part. And I think more and more people are, are uh, knowing this meanwhile, um, perhaps through the pandemic, because they, the, the only place to travel uh, was the nearest forest, for example, um, also in Germany. In, in our, uh, our lonely um, mountains here, that means that we are, are not meeting just once a day, a person out in the forest, but two times a day. <laughs> so it's not, it was not very crowded, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, I noticed that there were more people out. And uh, you're exactly right. Um, uh, it's it's you, it's perhaps not that easy uh, to to talk to animals, but uh, they they are communicating with you. Um, for example, we have um, which I described in the books uh, the crow, um, which became became a friend for more than eight years now. Um, this year, uh, it, it, it's 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 a male, and um, of course it's. Um, this male has also a female. That they are a couple, and they they had a, had two chickens. But we had uh, uh, because of the climate change, which is not usual. Usually here in spring, a very severe storm, and the the the, the two chickens were blown out of the nest. So it was a, a great uh damage and this little family was destroyed but but and we thought that because it was in our first uh, first house garden uh that that the the crow uh we, we, um, whose name which name is uh Coco, um was angry about us because i i don't know we had a certain feeling but it wasn't of course because it's intelligent <laughs> it came it came back and uh but it was just just uh sad of course and uh behaved a little bit different and so so um i'm happy every day when i when i go out um of the further first house sometimes it's uh there are two snails making love which is i think not an automatic reaction 
because I think they have fun and uh, so go out just a few few uh, meters and you see so many little wonders of happiness of fun of whatsoever um, and that makes me happy every day and uh, and I hope that many 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 people can can uh, take part of this uh, by reading your books my books and then exploring the nature and it doesn't matter whether it is in the inner parts of new york city because there are trees there are animals there are much much more animals than people in new york city men and some people are not for example uh, i think you have in new york city there are more rats than people first then you have more birds then of course more ants more whatsoever so um it's it's a city of animals first and then uh, a city of people but it's people form strange rocks and animals would say hmm cubic rocks okay why not that's it and we think we have destroyed nature and we replaced it yeah of course it's a damage to nature but that doesn't mean that nature is, isn't still there so yeah um I, I would love, and I think it works, to connect people better to nature wherever they live. One of the uh, issues that uh, became more clear during the pandemic was as people turned to nature for solace and for healing um, in great numbers, uh, there was more of a realization of the inequitable distribution of natural settings in cities that uh, many neighborhoods have virtually no trees. And when you compare the poorer neighborhoods with the richer neighborhoods in terms of number of trees, there's no contest. And that this is literally a life and death issue because we now know because of the research that's finally uh, being done that uh, neighborhoods that have more trees, people live longer. Yeah. Uh, there are all kinds of benefits, attention deficit disorder, all of these things that were really not known uh, 15 years ago or 20 years ago uh, because academic world had, although scientists had virtually ignored the impact of the natural world experiences on human development. But when you look at the equity issue, now, now we're facing the post-pandemic world, whatever that will be. And one of the things that the new normal some people, and I would agree with this, are saying is that we've got to look at the distribution of nature because we're going to need it next time. This isn't the last pandemic. And which neighborhoods have it and which don't. And people are dying right now in neighborhoods because they don't have neighbor, they don't have nature. It's almost that clear at this point. Yeah, yeah. And um, there, there is strong evidence that, uh, for example, when you have more trees, uh, of course, we, you can measure that the temperature is, is many, many degrees lower in, in summertime. And we know that, for example, the last weeks we, we and that was really sad, had many people dying because of the high temperatures uh, at the West Coast. Uh, more trees means uh, less people die because of, uh, of the heat. That means, um, but uh, that there is also other effects. For example, that, that the blood pressure is sinking when you when you're under trees because you're part of the tree communication. And we have, I've did this experiment with a German TV host. Uh, we were in the city of Cologne. That's also it's, it's not as big as New York City, but it's um, a city with uh, one million inhabitants. Uh, we measured our blood pressure within the city and then outside in the forest. And, the, and outside in the forest, the blood pressure was significant lower. And uh, I love the, the, the side that it's the other way around. Um, in the forest, you have the normal blood pressure. In the city, you have the higher blood pressure. And that's exactly what you meant, I think, Richard. And we know that when you look, uh, when you're uh, in hospital, for example, and you look um, out of the window at a tree, you need less painkillers, you will recover faster. Uh, and that will also save lives. And uh, good hospitals know this and they, and if they don't have trees, uh, at minimum, they, they make green light um, to, to reduce pain for people. So, so we know that trees are very, very important for us and that they have an impact on our health. And I agree that we should have more trees in cities, but not in a row, like we use it like in LA. Um, 
but there is a new movement about tiny forests. That means that, you, for example, when you just have a space for three trees, then you can form a little forest. If you have more, it's better. So, so there should be more and more little forests in this in the city, and then it's not uh, just um, that the health becomes better, but the people have more fun because then you have more animals. That, that then they uh, the animals have a better life in city, and you can befriend yourself with with whomsoever. Uh, one of the issues, of course, is the climate emergency, and uh, I like to think of the four horsemen of the, of the apocalypse, which are the climate emergency, biodiversity collapse, pandemics, zoonotic pandemics, and human loneliness. And we can't do much about any one of those if, unless we do something about all three, all four at the same at the same time, simultaneously. And a lot of solutions that are being talked about are multiple solutions that they work on all four of those. Um, trees, planting forests happens to be one of those multi-solutions. And, and I've been looking into that and in terms of, and you know, all the stuff about, you know, half earth, E.O. Wilson and half earth and planting vast forests, hopefully not monocultures, but uh, multicultural, <laughs> multicultural forests. And that that will go a long way toward uh, sequestering carbon and, um, and and but also work with biodiversity collapse and human loneliness and, and lack of health and all of those. But when you look at trees, trees are a little problematic because they die, and then all the carbon they absorb, I think. And please explain that to the, this to me. Goes back into the atmosphere unless the trees are buried. And there's talk of, of digging vast trenches to bury trees in. And I, I'm wondering if you can educate us about how trees can, can save the planet. Yeah, the trees are our best companions in um, saving the climate. For example, um, uh, trees in most forests of the world become very, very old before they die. And in the moment we have very young forests all over the United States, in Canada, in Europe, most forests are young. Um, and, uh, in uh, Northern, North America, the, the, the trees can become very old, let's say 1,000 or 2,000 years. In Europe, um, I think the average age of old trees will be 500 years, but in, in the moment, the average age is less than 80 years. That means we have around about 400 years time before trees uh, will be, uh, be, uh, begin to die naturally. So um, and I think uh, within the next 400 years, uh, decisions uh, have, to be, have to be made. So uh, I think it's all about the next decades, not about the next 100 years or even 400 years. So in the next 400 years, uh, forests will store uh, a lot of carbon. That's one thing. The other thing is that, that a lot of carbon will store will be stored in the soil. Round about in old forests, round about 50%. And that is the first step to coal, uh, because coal are old forests, um, uh, fossilized forests. Um, so the, there is there will be no natural forest where all stored carb, carbon will be uh, one day released. That's that's uh, not the plan by nature. And which which is much more important than carbon is um, the cooling effect, uh, the local cooling effect, which I mentioned is uh, around about ten degrees Celsius. I don't know exactly what it is in Fahrenheit, but um, and, and in comparison to cities, more than 15 degrees. That is one of the benefits of forest, and that can be done very easily and very fast, let's say fast and tree speed, that means perhaps one, uh, one or two decades. And uh, forest creates actively uh, rain because they like it uh, colder, they like it uh, wet, and they, as we, we know that forest can create rain. For example, we know that um, the rain in China um, comes to 80% from the European Atlantic. And this rain is brought by forests through the Eurasian continent to China. And if you will chop those forests in between, for example, the Siberian forest, then China will um, have more severe droughts. So um, if you will, uh, forest um, let coming back 
you can create your own local rain. As a, that's a very strong proven. And, and uh, we have a German in Germany um, satellite watch for 15 years, and you, that's very easy to prove to make temperature uh, maps, uh, to make rain maps. And you see uh, all uh, every time when you have an old forest with all in German, it's um, of course beech trees, oak trees, uh, maple trees, um, trees like this. Or when you have old forests of those native species, you have more rain and you have a, a colder climate. So it's in our hands to let the forest uh, do the job. Uh, of course, we should reduce massively our um, carbon output. But on the other hand, forest, they, they give us, they reach uh, uh, out their, not their hands, but their branches and say, hmm, let us help you. And in the moment, our answer is the chainsaw and to burn it in power plants. We said, no, that's not the purpose of trees. In, in a power plant, trees can cannot store carbon. They cannot create rain. They cannot cool the climate, it's, it's the other way around. That's exactly what we European are doing at the moment. We are importing uh, a lot of pellets from the south, south uh, east of the United States to be burned in coal power plants. And then we say, wow, it's renewable. Um, we, are, we are fighting climate change. And uh, that's not, not, I'm not the part of we Europeans. I'm on the other side, um, we are fighting this. And um, that's one of uh, the many things our Forest Academy does to influence politicians not to import wooden pellets anymore, but to restore forests. I don't remember the exact statistic, but I think it's something like 40 or 50 or more percent of biodiverse lands uh, on, on Earth are actually controlled by indigenous people. Yeah. You, you may know the, the actual figure, but I'm wondering what the role of indigenous people in the future uh, will be uh, in terms of what we're talking about. Yeah. They, they could be our teachers. I have read an article from, the, from British Columbia that they found, um, uh, I, I'm not, I don't know the right expression, but I think it was about forest gardens, um, where, uh, which were managed more than 150 years ago by First Nations, and uh, which are now the spots in the forest, uh, the uh, richest biodiversity. And they could be a model for uh, environmental, uh, environmentally friendly forestry. And so I think I've, I've, I've talked a lot, for example, the Quaker First Nation, uh, which I support a little bit, and uh, they tried to train forest students and to learn and to develop to, uh, with me a, um, um, a way to, to manage their forest environmentally friendly, but it should be the other way around. I think we can learn a lot because exactly as you say, this forest, they look to be primeval, uh, to be primeval forest, but it, they turned out to be managed forest. And uh, if you can manage a forest that it looks and works like a primeval forest, wow, that's it. Yeah, there's a great book from 1991. I don't know if you read that uh, about uh, uh, prior to Columbus, you know, we had this image of, of, um, of tr uh, raw real wilderness and complete wilderness when actually uh, indigenous people in North America were actually ranching. They did it differently. There, the, the number of buffalo or the number of bison was actually kind of unnatural because they burned off vast areas of, in the Flint Hills near where I grew up in Kansas, they would burn that off and create more food for bison. And so in a sense, they, they were ranching without fences. And uh, in the Amazon, they were gardening vast areas that we now think are natural when actually they were created long ago by indigenous people. So um, I, I think, uh, David, uh, you had something to say. I was going to say, I could sit and listen to both of you talk all night long for several more hours, but we've got some wonderful uh, audience questions, and I, I want to save a little bit of time for them. So um, this first one's from Joanne. She says, she works with young children as a horticultural therapist. And in your opinion, or either of your opinion, what is the most important message to pass along to our youngest learners? It's up to me. Why don't you go first? <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, I think the, the most important lesson is um, uh, have fun, go out, have fun. Um, I think most children don't like biology lessons. They like to discover nature. For example, what we do here um, with edible uh, tree leaves, we like uh, to uh, let them try to, to figure out which tree species it is by taste. Uh, when, with close eyes, and then we feed them with, um, with for example, with beech leaves, leaves or, or birch leaves or oak leaves, and then they uh, try to find out, ah, this is an oak by taste. And that's cool. That's a lot of fun and to discover nature with all senses. I think uh, they will keep this in mind uh, till they are grown up. Uh, I think the most important uh, lesson is to pay attention, is to notice. And kids really aren't taught in school very often to pay attention, except to their teacher. And uh, you know, a, a brief story, uh, I visited a nature center. I think this is not long after Last Child in the Woods came out and in 2005, and I visited this nature center. It was a wonderful place. Wolves, it was in the North, actually wolves would come through the land of that nature center. And I was talking to this young woman and an uh, uh, environmental educator and she had a little uniform on and she was a terrific teacher, everybody really loved her and admired her. And when we were talking, she told me that the, the, the place that kids and families most wanted to go to at the nature center was the little pond down below the nature center. And the reason was there were frogs there. And I said, well, that's cool. Do you ever, do you ever take the kids and the parents down to the pond and sit there and wait until the frogs come back up? and just be with the frogs? And she said, uh, well, well, we do science experiments. We test the pH in terms of the water. And I, and I asked her again, do you ever, every, I asked her three times in the, in the same answer every time. Guy sitting next, standing next to us said, she couldn't hear your question. The reason is she's under so much pressure to meet state standards of science teaching that the idea of going down and just sitting with the frogs and paying attention and noticing and feeling what it might be like to be a frog that's alien to much of education now. Now there are extraordinary teachers out there and I've met a lot of them. I like to call them natural teachers. They're, sometimes they're environmental teacher, but oftentimes they're, uh, the English teacher takes kids out under the trees to write poetry where the biology teacher actually believes it's a good thing to get their hands wet, and their feet muddy at the, in the creek at the end of the schoolyard. There's great teachers out there and often they're, they're defying their principals, and their superintendents by getting their kids outdoors. Even now during the pandemic, there was a lot of talk about outdoor classrooms for social distancing. I'm not sure there was that much outdoor classrooms that were going on because it's, the education is so resistant to this. And, but I'm hoping that will change partly because of books like yours, Peter. So we have another great audience question from Susan this time um, asking, how long do you personally have to be in the forest with the trees to get to their speed and tune in to feel or communicate with them? Three days, more or less. Um, living in a city, people may need to understand how long it takes to really slow down. Um, as long as, as, as you like. Um, for example, um, if you're a little bit busy, one or two hours uh, will be enough. Uh, it depends on what you're doing. Um, uh, it's, it's best not to have a schedule, whether you have one hour or one day. Um, um, just lay under a tree, as Richard said, uh, take your time, watch the nature, um, uh, take a deep breath and, and perhaps you, you smell what's going on. For example, when you're in a conifer forest on a, wet, a very hot summer day, you can smell the stress of the trees. It's, it's, it's very, for us, it's a nice smell because it smells so aromatic, but uh, for trees, it's, it's a little bit stressy. You can, you can smell this. Or um, what I also love is um, to, um, to calm down, to um, close your eyes, and then afterwards uh, draw a sound map 
uh, of the surrounding area that that you perhaps when you're in a city uh, accept uh, car noises <laughs> but, you, but try to find out nature and nature sounds like birds or the wind going through the uh, leaves or whatsoever so uh, then you calm down um, your body reacts uh, in, in, in every case because uh, it's uh, responding to the to the um, tree communication and your blood pressure will sink but when you when you relax it works better of course and uh, um, if you just have two hours it's it's okay for the rest of the day if you have one day out in the forest um, it, it will uh, have a good health impact for the rest of the week and if you can have it more often okay enjoy <laughs> Uh, Peter, based on what you said before, I would think that you've really got this slowing down thing down to a quote science unquote. I mean, if you're watching snails have sex, you've 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 nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid we've only got time for about one more question uh, from the audience. Uh, this is, as I said, this has been such a fascinating evening. Uh, Colleen asks. What thoughts do you have about the need to increase greenery in schoolyards? So many uh, urban schools just sit in an air, a sea of asphalt. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think that's very, very important to get your hands dirty, to feel the soil and see all the little creatures going through. I think it's very important because even if, if you if there's just a small space to do this and to and to for example to grow some tomatoes uh, that you know that your food comes from plants um, and that we that we depend on nature i think this connection is very very important um because many many children living in, in cities this they think okay um i get my food from the supermarket uh, but that that a city is just a trading place for nature goods uh, um, many children don't know so it's i think it's important to have here and there a little little connection let's say a, 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 like a plug to nature and uh, if, it, if it's just a small spot it's okay if it's a bigger spot it's better but i think every school should have uh, at minimum a little garden where children can experience of plant life or and and then the de uh, depending animal life really means one of the most important things is to teach future teachers how to take their students outdoors many uh, teachers are very afraid of doing that They're, they didn't do it as kids many of them because generationally nature deficit disorder started a while back and they want to do it but they're worried about lawyers they're worried about their principal they're worried about bugs and so that has to start i think in in uh, in edu education uh, schools but when i wrote last child in the woods which was published in 2005 I could find only about 60 studies, either about the deficit of nature in kids' lives or um, uh, the benefits, these great benefits. Only about 60 studies. There may have been more, but that's what I could find and felt comfortable um, quoting. Today, if you go to the Children Nature Network, which is the nonprofit that grew out of the last child, uh, we've created a database, um, a, a, a library of abstracts of over a thousand studies on these things uh, that the this has now become a growth industry what was ignored pretty much by the academic world is is now a growth industry um, a lot of that research shows incredible cognitive improvement in kids and in adults if they spend part of their time learning about anything in nature not just about biology or science but anything not only that, the, the schoolyards that have been compared, the, the natural play space versus the typical uh, uh, cement or asphalt uh, playground, the kids in the natural play spaces, if they exist at a school, are far more likely to invent their own games. That's, uh, that's fundamental to learning uh, executive function. Uh, to, you know, it has something to do with the future of the economy. If you want entrepreneurs, you got to develop that. But what's uh, even as interesting to me is this research shows also that kids playing in the natural play space are far, far more likely to invite other kids who don't look like them, who are not the same race, who are not the same culture, 
who are not the same gender to play with them. So a natural schoolyard should, every school should have a natural play space. And we're a long way from that, even though natural uh, preschools, uh, native, uh, nature-based preschools have really skyrocketed recently in the last few years, but we've got a long way to go that has to be uh, the part of the future of, of education. And unfortunately, we've gone through a period where not only were they canceling recess, but they were building schools without any windows. Maybe, maybe a slit up at the, architects call that the visions strip up at the top. And we have to turn that around. I mean, that's, there's no doubt about that. Well, Richard, Peter, thank you both so much. I'm sorry to say we're out of time. It's very late in Germany where Peter is and he's got to get up and go out to the trees in the morning. So thank you both so much. This has been a wonderful evening. The book is Heartbeat of, The Heartbeat of Trees. Um, and you've all bought copies of it, you've got them, or they're coming to you soon. Um, have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone, and have a great evening.